You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. For many lifetimes, the people who spoke the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota languages followed great bison herds across the land we now call South Dakota. They used great woolly bison skins to keep warm through winter. They ate bison meat and found uses for almost every part of the animal. The buffalo provided us with uh, food, shelter, clothing, and utensils. The whole buffalo is used by our people. And so that means our livelihood. And so when it was uh, uh, unnecessarily slaughtered, that that just took away our, our, all of that from us. And so we were never, I might add this, we were never defeated until we were defeated by starvation. So that's what the buffalo means to us, life, basically, all of life. The buffalo is also spiritual because it keeps us alive physically, mentally, and spiritually. And there's also a legend, our story, that the buffalo brought us, our people, way back when, you know, a, a tool, like, like I guess it's a tool, a spiritual tool through which we can pray to the great spirit God, or, you know, through the peace pipe. And so the buffalo was the, was the uh, being that brought us that pipe too. So that's the spiritual connection we have with the buffalo. There were songs and dances honoring bison, or sung to prepare bison hunters. Songs and dances still heard and seen at powwows today. Another mighty animal galloped into the world of these people. Horses came with Spanish settlers to America and moved northward from Mexico. It's hard to imagine a more perfect world for horses than the Dakota Plains. Miles and miles of rolling, grassy prairie. And it's hard to imagine anyone taking to horses faster than these American Indian people. They became expert riders who could travel greater distances to hunt bison. They raised horses, traded horses, and as successfully as any people ever, used horses to become mighty warriors. They were called the Sioux by some other American Indian people. That was the name European explorers and fur traders first heard and also used. But the people others called Sioux thought of themselves as 13 groups connected by families and marriage. Some names these groups had for themselves were Wapitan, Sisseton, Yankton, Oglala, Brule, Hunk Papa, and Mini Kanju, among others. Their life 200 years ago is hard for most of us to imagine. There was regular movement, following bison herds, 
moving entire villages and packing up villages when the bison moved. Changing seasons meant movement too. As winter approached, the villages were set up in valleys sheltered from cruel north winds. There was constant movement, but there was rhythm to it, the rhythm of bison and seasons, until the unthinkable happened. The bison disappeared. After dotting vast prairies for human lifetimes beyond memory, they vanished in less than one lifetime. Overhunted by newcomers moving west, and because of demand for bison skins in eastern cities and Europe. Herds were cleared so railroads could be built. Some American Indians overhunted bison too because they found they could trade skins for other valuable items. American Indians who relied on bison had no choice except to live close to United States government agencies, places where they could get other kinds of meat, clothing fabric, and everything else bison once supplied. Government officials said it was time for wandering American Indian people to stop, build houses, and learn farming. Some did, but others, especially those in what's now Western South Dakota, angrily rejected the idea. Tasunka Witko, whose name in English was Crazy Horse, said, We do not want your civilization. We would live as our fathers did, and their fathers before them. Tashunka Witko. Mapia Luta, or Red Cloud, said, It is an insult to the spirits of our ancestors. Are we to give up their sacred grounds to be plowed for corn? Lakota, I am for war. Mahpia Luta. And there was war. As long as Crazy Horse and Red Cloud's people had horses, they could make war. The United States Army learned that painfully in the 1860s and 1870s. The Army had very little success in battles against these skilled horse warriors. In 1876, the Army suffered one of its most famous defeats ever. It was the year gold seekers were pouring into the Black Hills, a land Crazy Horse and Red Cloud believed holy, a place the government once promised it would keep off limits to settlers. In June of that year, on a river northwest of the Black Hills called Little Bighorn, Crazy Horse, his warriors, and other American Indian warriors battled Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer's Army troops. None of Custer's soldiers survived. But victory in summer didn't solve the problem of living through winters without bison meat. Even the people of Crazy Horse and Red Cloud had to come to land set aside for them by the United States government, where there would be government food. It was either that or starvation. The lands set aside were reservations. Today we might ask, what did government leaders of the time think they were doing? Did they see reservations as places where American Indians would eat, get medical care, and learn to survive in a world without bison? Did they think of them as places where people would forget their Indian ways? Were reservations out of the way spots where American Indians would be mostly forgotten and kept separate from other Americans? Keeping different races of people apart from each other is segregation. Unfortunately, it's been attempted in many ways throughout United States history. But over time, segregation always fails because people refuse to stay apart. Today, people descended from the bison hunters live in all South Dakota communities. Not all reservation residents are American Indians. And many South Dakotans in the 21st century claim both American Indian and European ancestors. 
As for people a hundred years ago who perhaps thought reservations were places where American Indians would drop their traditional ways, history proved them wrong. The old traditions are celebrated on reservations like nowhere else, by people who live here and by visitors from around the world. The people of the bison are forever part of South Dakota, and so are the bison themselves. These great animals, nearly wiped out, made a comeback thanks mostly to South Dakotans. During the winter of 1880-81, the Dupuy brothers rode in the last great bison hunt. They brought home five live bisons. Descendants of those animals were purchased by Scotty Phillip, a rancher who wanted to save the bison. In 1914, specifically built wagons carried some of the Dupuy Phillip herd to the Black Hills Wildlife Preserve, now called Custer State Park where it grew into a herd of a couple thousand. Now, bison are seen all across the state, in the park, on ranches, and on reservations. Reservation leaders know bison will always be part of spiritual life for some people here. We want to teach our people to take on a characteristic of that buffalo and to be able to, they always tell the story about a blizzard coming and a buffalo will face the blizzard, you know they'll hit the blizzard or the storm head on. And that's what we want people, that's our walk of life here as Lakota people. We we went through many, many different things and, and, and our walk here is, you know, we're still in existence today. And it was because of the buffalo and the horse that, that kept us alive. So we really, you know, the animal, the, the animal nation, we really hold them in high esteem because they, uh, they, they brought us to this point here today. These leaders wonder whether bison should also be hunted, raised for meat, be used to attract visitors, or just left alone. Those decisions will likely be made in the 21st century. For additional information, a teacher's guide, games, quizzes, and more, log on to dakotapathways.org.